Welcome everybody to another session in our Women Lead Online Forums brought to you by Connected Women of Influence. I'm Patty Vargas, I'll be your host today. And today we have a subject matter expert in the hot seat who was actually willing to say, go ahead, ask me anything. And our session today lasts for about an hour. If you've joined with video, you'll be able to see our guests and the attendees alike. And questions and comments are always welcome. Uh, keep the conversation going. If there's something that you'd like to contribute anonymously, though, just put it in the chat to me and I will share it for you. Now, our topic today is the balanced business. You can imagine that, having a balanced business. <laughs> can you imagine how having an accounting strategist who would work one-on-one -on -one with you could really help you get control of your business finances and help you relieve stress, maximize tax benefits, and increase cash flow? I mean, if you can just imagine, wow, we are so lucky because that strategist is LaVon Shields, and she's here with us today. And for more than 20 years, she's been helping small business owners become more profitable, accountable, and efficient by providing accounting and bookkeeping services, tax prep, and financial mindset coaching. So in addition to all of the accounting and QuickBooks expertise that LaVon has, she is also an NLP practitioner. She's a master practitioner. So I have a feeling that that's where the financial mindset coaching stuff comes in. <laughs> so we're gonna find out all about that. So LaVon, without further ado, take it away. It's all yours. Oh, awesome. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Hello, people. How are you guys? So a little bit about me, just to kind of give you some, some background on, on me. I started my company, Management Consultants of America, back in 1999, because I knew that I was not going to be a very good employee. It's just not going to be in the best interest of me to work for people. So I, I knew that working on, my, on building my own business was going to be crucial. Uh, but to kind of back it, back, it back, back it up a little bit more than that, I got into managing money when I was nine. I was a Girl Scout. I mean, I didn't go all the way through. I was the brownie. That's that, as far as I got. I got an ugly dress, that horrible brown dress. Me too. <laughs> all the brownies wear that. That's a horrible color. I don't know. That's just horrible. Plus, my mom was the leader, and so that was just kind of a color, <laughs> you know. Um, all my friends were in brownies, so my, my dad took me to a troop, and it was the wrong troop. It was the wrong everything, but he was just gung-ho to do it, and my mom said, hey, you want her to do it? She wants to do it? You guys do it, because she didn't want to be responsible for possibly running a troop, I don't think. So it was that wonderful time of year, you know, that, that lovely time, cookie time. That means that, you know, everybody's buying cookies or doing like a drug out there with the cookies. <laughs> I had cookies. Um, and what he did is instead of just having me take the order form and take it around to friends and family, he bought cases directly from the, the troop. So he literally bought a bunch of cases and he looked at me and he told me, whatever you sell, you get to keep the cash. And I ate the chocolate chip and then I sold the rest of them because I mean, come on, it's a chocolate chip cookie. You gotta <laughs> love those, right? <laughs> So I ate those and I had, and I, was, I went around and did the friends and family thing and, and sold the rest of the cookies. But what I had was money. I had cash. And at nine, 10 years old, that's it's kind of a, a, it's not overwhelming, but it's a little empowering to, to know that you have choices. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I'm the youngest of three. So my, my one guaranteed choice is to go to my older siblings. So they, they were keeping it, would, would always ask me for money because I always had it. But I got into the habit of keeping track of it. So you know those organizers that you, you they used to have, they had the whole little financial section we can write in. Mm -hmm. all the money. I was addicted to those things. <laughs> I loved them. I loved the whole fact that there was a place I could put information and I could keep track of it. It was, it was amazing. I was like the only 10 year old walking around with a little organizer. <laughs> all over the place just so I can keep track and then I would use the you know the contact section for family and stuff like that but this is before cell phones this is before all that so why I needed an organizer where was I gonna be about an adult I don't know but the whole tracking of it was very fascinating to me 
So keeping track of it, knowing exactly what I could do, knowing I had options, knowing I could choose what I wanted to do was, was very big for me. And I, I really, really love that. Mm -hmm. Well, fast forward, I, um, I started working, I would do internships at my, at my dad's record label. He at the time was president of Motown Records in Los Angeles, and I would work in different departments. And I learned admin. So I learned how to run an office, how to run a department. There was one summer I interned in the catalog department. The whole staff went away for a week long strategic planning session and they left me to run the office for a whole week. So I learned admin. And then when I went and got my college degree in accounting and realized, okay, so this is really about creating systems. I'm, I'm seeing how they're, they're teaching me the information from the accounting side. And what I realized is, well, people are the ones making these decisions. They have the receipts, they have the, the documentation. They're the ones that are choosing to write the checks or swipe their debit card. And it's about, I need, what I realized is people needed the opportunity to create a system to keep track of all this stuff. They, there was never really systems in place. There was just, hey, I need your information for tax time. And then at, at tax time, it's, oh, you didn't do this right. You didn't do this right. Mm -hmm. And then we'll just repeat, repeat, repeat. Right. <laughs> or, oh, I need this. Oh, this isn't right. Oh, I need this. Oh, this isn't right. And I realized at that point that it, it's, a, it's a dual edged sword. So teaching people the organization of the information as well as the data entry was all in one you couldn't really separate one from the other uh, i've been through audits and uh, one of my first jobs was actually at a bank and it was audit season and we were getting audited and what i found in that department was the records were horrible everything was stored in a way where only those inside the office could actually find it not for someone outside of it to be able to look for it and I realized, okay, systems should be pretty universal. That way, anyone who comes in and out should be able to find it so that you can figure out what's going on. So fast forward, I, I'm realizing there's systems. I'm realizing there's processes that it, it, it's more than just the data entry. And I was introduced to NLP because I realized that it's another part of it for business owners to grasp. It's not just the accounting as far as the data entry and having the, the documentation, there's the mindset attached to it. And what I realized is what big company CEOs do is they run their business off of their financial reports. They're not looking at bank balances. They're not looking at bank statements. They have their team give them financial reports and that's how they set their goals and their standards for their business. And I realized every business owner should be operating in that format they should see themselves as a CEO. No matter what size you're doing, no matter what you're doing, whether it be you found a great home-based business so that you can be with your kids, or you do have a multi-million dollar organization, your mindset should be of that of a CEO. You are running an organization that is designed to fulfill a goal, fulfill a, a need, meet some objectives. And I wanted every business owner to take on that mindset. Mm -hmm. Through NLP training, Neuro Linguistic Programming, so that I can discover a way of helping business owners make that transition into becoming a CEO. Um, can I ask you a quick question before you sure. continue? When you say LP, LP to me means loss prevention. Is LP something else to you? Is oh, it's NLP, so Neuro Linguistic Programming. Oh, NLP. Okay, yeah, thank NLP, you. sorry. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, what is she talking? That's not how those words work. <laughs> Yeah, and maybe give a little bit of a background about what NLP means. Awesome. Yeah, I can I, can I know do that. just enough to be dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, when I go big picture with it, I, I ask people, so have you ever heard of Tony Robbins? And most people have. And what he uses when he's helping people get through their breakthroughs is neuro-linguistic programming. So what it is, is, is the ability to use language to reprogram the way our brains are functioning. Yeah. And most sales trainings are based off of, or NLP based. It's about being able to de develop the rapport with the person that you're, you're talking to, how to use languaging to guide them into wherever you want them to go. There's a fine line with it. There's um, and it's intention, but you can be a, um, inspiring and motivational or you can be manipulative. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. People have used it to be manipulative. We actually, the, there's a, 
a guy out there who teaches men how to ha get multiple dates in one night using NLP techniques. Crappy, right? It's, <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that, that's why with my instructor, she's like, there's a very fine line between, you know, between supporting someone and helping them through their issue and being manipulative. And it's the intention. What is your intention behind the be being able to get kind of behind someone's barriers and into the way their brain is programmed for, to operate and then help them change that? Yeah. So for me, what I, I learned out of that was m many people... They start off their business as a technician. They know how to do something, uh, whether it be cooking, whether it be watching children, whether it be accounting, there's something they know how to do. And whether it be an internal desire to want to make money with that, or everyone's telling them like, hey, you can make money doing this. Either way, there was a, a, a part where it went from an idea to, hey, let me work this. Let's work this and I want to go out on my own and I want to be responsible for my own income. Uh, the problem is, is that there's not the mental transition from, oh, I'm an employee and I make money to, oh, I'm a business owner. I'm responsible for my own money because we're not taught that in school. Our educational system is not designed to teach us to go out and be entrepreneurs. It, we're just, it's just not about that. And since that's not a standard part of the development of people, it, it gets kind of put by the wayside. Mm -hmm. There's all these parts to creating, to man managing the operations of a business, the, the business aspect of the thing you know how to do um, that people are missing. They, they miss that opportunity because, again, it's not taught unless you find a mentor who can, can help you out and is willing to work with you and walk you through that transition in your industry. It usually becomes a, you know, a hit and miss, shooting from the hip kind of situation and, and you, you stumble into success. Yeah, she, she met with me last last year. We started working together, um, and she came in. She said, "I think I'm getting ready to stumble into a million dollar business." <laughs> Go, um, what a what a what a stumble! You know, <laughs> that's a pretty good stumble <laughs> stumble to go into. Um, but she's like, "Yeah, I'm. I'm I think I'm going to stumble into a million dollar business." Wow. When we started working together, I'm like, "Yeah, you you're hitting a million dollars." Or this. Mm -hmm. Congratulations, what a problem to have. The dilemma was the same with her that I had with many of my other clients was getting out of the technician part of the business and then being the actual CEO of the organization, seeing it from 50,000 feet, seeing it that high and being able to say, okay, how do I get my business from point A to point B and be able to navigate the potential roadblocks that are coming in all areas of business? And, and that's when I realized that I, I want my soapbox speech to be everyone, especially women, we need to consider ourselves CEOs of our organization. We should be able to look at our business and go and, and detach ourselves somewhat from it and go, okay, so what is going on with this organization? What needs, what can I fix? Where can I make the changes and how do I plot out that process? And that, that's what my kind of objective, my soapbox uh, opera, little speech is. I like what you said about, um, you know, in, in kind of going back to the, the NLP side of it is language is really important because so what important. comes out of our mouth is, is usually originating from our head or from our heart. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's coming from somewhere. So for your client to say, I'm about to stumble into a million dollar business. Nobody stumbles into a million dollar <laughs> business unless daddy left it to you, you know? <laughs> right. It's more like she probably was super smart and mm -hmm. very strategic, but wouldn't allow herself to say that. Hey, I just, you know, uh, thought my way or strategized my way or worked my way into a million dollar business. No, I stumbled into it, you know? Yeah. And that's usually what happens. There are, you know, it's a, I, I was able to, to do some strategic steps, but instead of taking ownership of that, like, wow, no, you, yeah, you made some strategic steps that took you from, you know, an employee to a owner of a company with multiple, I mean, I think we had 24 total employees throughout the year. Mm -hmm. Last year, it might've been in between 24 and 35 or so employees that's a lot you're right that's not a stumble that is a strategic process to get through and that is exactly what where, why I, I decided to add this coaching component to my services mm -hmm. 
you know, getting you getting business owners to, to grasp. Yeah, you this is your domain. You are the queen of this castle. This is how you you and it's all up to you on how you're gonna do it. You have full control. Yeah. Uh, LP coach, she has this amazing saying that I, I loved is um, choice is a powerful thing, suffering is always optional. <laughs> when you take that into consideration and you're looking at your business and you're, you're trying to figure out why is my cash flow the way it is? Why is my net income the way it is? Why is my tax liability the way it is? What is going on with my business? All of it's a choice. So we're, how do we backtrack our way into that choice, figuring out how was it made? Was it made consciously or unconsciously? Because a lot of times, a lot of things we do, we do it by habit. I mean, most of the things we do, I can look at someone's bank statement and see their entire pro mental process. Like, oh, well, you obviously like to leave, uh, eat out. There's a lot of cash charges, so that means it's probably personal and business. Like, well, you, you obviously order stuff from this supplier and you do it on the, this frequency. We do a lot of things just by thought. Like, I mean, we drive that way. There'll be several times I'll driving somewhere and I'm going, where am I going again? <laughs> <laughs> or if I'm on a familiar freeway, it's like, oh, I'm just supposed to be going this way. Like, oh no, I'm going somewhere else. I'm supposed to be going, going north when I get here instead of going south or anything like that. We do things so unconsciously that we don't realize it. And that's what, when I realized, okay, so incorporating this into my, kind of coaching, training, accounting services was going to be a big part of working, helping business owners, especially women transition from just being a technician who knows how to make some money mm -hmm. to the CEO who's running an organization. Right, right. My biggest thing. Yeah. So in this process, when I realized, okay, so how do I help people grasp the transition into CEO? Because some people think, well, I just have a small business. I'm not CEO. Or so, so I'm a sole proprietor, so I'm not a CEO, so to speak. And I realized, okay, so let's, let's break down what does a CEO do? Well, they make the major decisions. They manage the business, mm -hmm. create and carry out the company's mission and vision, and they develop the company's short and long-term goals. Well, we're all CEOs, mm -hmm. from the MLM work at home all the way up to someone who has a multi-million dollar manufacturing firm. You're doing all of that. There's going to be some delegation in some of those tasks, but all of that's the same. They're, they're, you're at this higher level of thinking. And I realized, okay, so if I can transition the thought process from, oh, my business is small, so therefore I shouldn't be considered a CEO to, nope, it's strictly task-based. Are you doing these things? If you're doing these things, you are a CEO. So if you're walking like a duck, <laughs> you're quacking like a duck, you are a duck. <laughs> okay. Embrace it and love it and, and go with it, right? You know, that, that's our, our right when we go into it and create a business is to be that boss, you know, to, to sit there and wear that crown and do what we do. Mm -hmm. So then when you, I take that and then I go, okay, so then how do I help businesses get into a CEO mastery mindset? You know, how do I help them learn to make strategic business decisions? Because that's really what we want to do is want to make strategic business decisions. How do I help them be able to manage their business at a 50,000 foot level? And how do I help them carry out the vision and the mission of the company and keep the company on track? What is the best way to do that? And what I, I developed where I learned was um, to look at business as a three-legged stool. And it was so funny when I, I really, when it's all hit home for me, I was at lunch with my mom, we went to Islands. And when it's just the two of us, we'll just go sit in the bar area, right? So you have the bar stools, everything going. And I, I pick a stool and it was wobbly. So I'm just sitting there like on the stool doing this whole little dance thing because it's wobbly. I can't concentrate, the, the server's trying to get my order, but I'm sitting here making a song with my little wobbly stool and I go, <gasps> This is how business owners react. This is how they're doing. They're focusing on this wobbly stool and they're not focusing on anything else. They're just, they're realizing they're out of balance. So when I was originally taught to look at business as the three-legged stool, the original mindset was to look at sales and marketing as one leg. And then you had your operations as a second leg. And then the accounting was the third leg. And what I realized is it's not because sales and marketing are two separate activities you can market the heck out of your business and get a lot of people in, but if you can't close them, that's a whole different ball of wax right there. Yeah. So what I realized is it's the marketing is one leg, the sales is another leg, the operations, the doing what you do is the third leg, and the connector is the accounting. 
That's the communicator. Is my marketing making sense? How much did I spend on marketing? And you know, when you, so when you look at your business, you're looking at it from those three levels. So the, the first part is, can I bring people in the door? You know, if I put out a $10,000 marketing uh, campaign and no one comes in, that means I did something way wrong, right? Mm -hmm. I was identifying who my target market was and where do, where do I find them? Right. Speak in their language. Mm -hmm appealing to who they are and letting them know that I exist and that I'm a, I'm a solution for their problem. Mm -hmm. right? That I just said, hey, I'm going to get these flyers and I'm going to just blanket the whole city. Well, that doesn't work, <laughs> right? right? So oh, I've wasted money, I've wasted time, and I've gotten no return for it. Mm -hmm. that's, that's one leg that we would want to take some consideration in and figure out where do I fix this in my business? Because again, we just said that we spent $10,000 and we got nothing back. Right. That's a huge blow, right? Yeah. That's a huge blow, especially if your business is under a hundred thousand dollars. You spent ten. Whoa, that's that's a really big difference with what's going on. Mm -hmm. So then the next process is looking at your sales. So you you did the ten thousand dollars campaign and you actually got a bunch of people coming in the door. They're all like, oh, that's exactly what I want. You're exactly the solution to my problem. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But for some reason you can't convert them. Mm -hmm. like actually telling you, yes, you are the solution to my problem, but you're not getting them to actually buy the services. That's a big, pretty, another pretty big problem, right? It's, it's got all these people who say they want what I have, but I can't get them to actually buy it from me. Mm -hmm. I had one client when we were, I was really developing this system. It was a, a water filtration system. Uh, they, they sold water filtration systems and we had developed this process to be able to kind of do a checkpoint for the sales process to determine, okay, did all these things get, get checked off? And we used the financial report to, to verify that. And we'd also use that financial report to, to figure out what did we net on the job? We knew the minimum needed to be a 20% net on the job. That's from, from the cost of the equipment, from the appointment setters to the, the salesperson's commission, the installers, all of that, after paying all that, we needed to do a minimum of 20% for the, it to be worthwhile. So, of course, we had some sales reps who were knocking out of the park. We were getting 35, 40, sometimes 50% return, I mean, uh, net on our jobs. That's awesome. But then we'd have some sales reps who were just at 20 or below 20. And I would go talk to the sales, rep, sales manager and go, so we've got some issues here. We know 20 is our minimum, but we've got these guys right here who cannot, or they're, they're just hitting the minimum or barely hitting the minimum. Mm -hmm. And then the new conversation becomes, are they really sales reps or are they people that we brought into the company and we want to keep them in the company because they became family, um, but they're not actually hitting, hitting their, their numbers. And when we look at it from that standpoint, the question becomes, and can we move them somewhere else for the sake of the business? Is there somewhere else where they can thrive? Mm -hmm. this number and looking at what their commissions are they can't survive off that they, they cannot survive off of that and then when you tell me oh is, well they also have another part-time job well then that means we're not actually supporting them if, if they can't come work with us full-time and we'd be able to support that and that be you know they have a desire to want to be with us full-time but they can't because they're not meeting those goals then they're not in the right spot mm -hmm. or can we get a one of our our top salespeople to work with them to train them, to, to mentor them into becoming better. Mm -hmm. Once we realized and saw that problem, we were able to go, okay, now we can fix it. We were able to move people out of sales who didn't want to be sales reps. They just thought it would be a good place to make some money. They really preferred to do customer service. They wanted to be able to, to be there when people called and asked questions. And all of a sudden their productivity went sky high. Yeah. There were great reviews from people who would talk to them and saying, hey, this, sales, this, this customer service rep was great, answered all my questions, they helped me get scheduled, a maintenance scheduled, they actually followed up with me to make sure that it all went well. So now they're thriving, and now we have our other sales reps who were able to take on that kind of the slack for not, not having the additional reps, and they were out there killing it. They were, <laughs> they were making a bunch of money. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, wow, okay, so we have our marketing, we know we're doing a good job with our marketing, our sales led, we figured out how to fix that one. So then the next leg becomes the operations, the how we do what we do, right? Mm -hmm. Many times people, you know, like I said, we're, we're creatures of habit. We just do something the way that we do it and don't really pay attention to how does it work big picture um, or something as, as, I don't want to use the word 
traumatic, but that's just what popped in my head. But uh, it's uh, more of a, we're trying to impress the outside world as opposed to focusing on, on working within our, our, our lane, staying in our lane. Right. So I have a client where I'm looking at their financials. I see their marketing as well because their sales are great and their sales are great. And I'm looking at their operational costs and I'm going, wow, so do we really need this thousand square foot facility that's costing us so much in rent? Mm -hmm. Like this is probably not the highest and best use of our resources right here. Mm -hmm. Or I had one company and it was construction. So it was very interesting that we were able to pick this out. I'm looking at the financials and I go, wow, our payroll, even for construction is extremely high. Well, turns out half the staff was padding their timesheets and no one was paying attention. Mm. No one was looking at it from that 50,000 foot level and saying, how did I have a team of three? How is two of them on time and one of them's late? Right. All had to go together. <laughs> they should have yeah. all been on time or all been late. Yeah. And we realized, well, it's the systems. It's the processes you have in, in, involved, engaged in in your operations. And, and, and if you don't know what some of those targets ought to be, you're not paying attention to that, wow, I really exceeded that. You know, the baseline should be X and I'm way up here, you know. So. Right, exactly. We had the same problem. We were looking at materials. They finally did an inventory check and we realized there was no checks and balance between how stuff got ordered. So we looked at the inventory and we found we had enough for about 10 jobs. Mm -hmm. well, we had two on the board and yeah. the pipeline. <laughs> so I was like, so who approves the purchasing of, of inventory? Who approves this process? N there wasn't any imbalance in there. Mm -hmm. Was it able to verify what was going on? So then you look at your operations and you go, okay, so we can need to make some adjustments here. We need to, to create some checks and balances on who's allowed to, to purchase things. Who, how do we verify that that's an accurate thing to do? And how do we keep track of where everything is going? Mm -hmm. And then this is where the accounting kind of comes into play, is the numbers are going to tell you. They're going to tell you what's going on. They're going to tell you, okay, so sales are fine. We're not lacking in the sales department. We can't increase our, our income because we're at industry standard. Um, we, we don't want to introduce a new project, a product or service just yet because we don't have the infrastructure to support it. Mm -hmm. So our sales are fine. Um, our marketing is obviously doing well, so, so we know that those two areas are fine. So then we look at the other areas of business, which would be the operations. Where do we make this adjustment? Mm -hmm. Certain situations, you might be willing to take kind of a loss. So one of the examples that I have is I had a business, um, a business and the, the marketing team developed this amazing marketing strategy. I mean, it was an amazing marketing program uh, uh, system. And it went out and it, it ran like clockwork. And then we had our amazing sales team went out and sold the crap out of that. I mean, it was great. We had people coming in, coming in. It was awesome. Then we got to the operations side and we're realizing, ooh, we have a lot of overtime that we have to, to pay in order to fulfill these orders. Mm -hmm. and everyone kind of started going a little crazy like oh my god it really didn't work we don't have the capability the sales people worried about you know sales getting canceled like what do you mean we don't have the capability of doing this our, our overtime is, is going up the, up, up the, the, in the, the going sky high what are we going to do what are we going to do and the owners in the background going this was kind of a part of my plan i have cash reserve to cover this but what i knew is that if we get them in the door and we fulfill the first set of orders, then we have them for repeats. We now have a database of people for repeats. Mm -hmm. He saw the whole board, or he saw the full stool, and realized that there was he was willing to sacrifice paying a little more right now for his, in his overtime, knowing it was going to create repeat for his business. Right. And create a cycle. We wouldn't have to go through that same level of, of production as we did for this one, one run. Mm -hmm. that have to go in the future and then we can stagger it out from that point to determine you know what how do we go back in when do we put the marketing team back out there for a new promotion when do we send the salespeople back out there to close it and then making sure that we can trickle it through correctly so that the operations can keep and uh, keep it in in alignment with the orders right one time you know heavy lifting but after you got on the other side of it it was fine mm -hmm. the ceo level of looking at stuff so when you look at it from the accounting standpoint, then you, you do, you take in consideration, you know, say, so what is the marketing budget? You know, we're, we're living in, in a techno technological age where there's several different ways of doing marketing, right? 
So is it a matter of putting all your money into the marketing or do you focus on how, what are my low tech ways of being able to pull people in? And am, am I targeting the right people? You know, am I putting my information in the right spot and, and am I, Am I being diligent and strategic with my marketing budget? My and that same thing on the sales side. This is where we're talking about pricing. Are we pricing this correctly? You know, are we too low for if for and any particular reason? And sorry, guys, I just got a mark on my battery. So <laughs> give me one second. This is really is fascinating, you know, because um, it and I liked the analogy of the the three legged stool because. Um, we can put so much effort into one of those legs and, and we're not being successful and we can't figure out why we're not being successful. Well, it's because, yeah. you know, we've, we've put all of our, our eggs in the marketing basket and mm -hmm. then we can't figure out why the rest of it isn't working or, or you know, possibly it, it's the operations that really makes it fall down because you don't have those benchmarks. You don't have a business plan that you're kind of measuring all of your stuff against. Exactly. Exactly. And that, that's where, you know, that CEO mindset kind of comes into play. How do you see the whole field? Mm -hmm. You have to be a technician at heart and you're so focused on making sure I can give the best product or provide the best service to my clients and I will do it at whatever cost. Mm -hmm. As you're growing your business and you bring on more technicians to support you, that at whatever cost is no longer really valid. Because now it's not just your time you're taking in consideration. There's other people who are going to be submitting timesheets and wanting to get paid yeah. for the work they're doing. Um, and, or you might be a great salesperson and, and can, can help your, your role in the company is, hey, I can go make the sales and someone else is going to fulfill the orders. But if you're not paying attention, oh my goodness, I'm pushing too many, too many orders in and they, it can't get fulfilled. And you're not seeing the whole board, you're not seeing the, the, the stool and seeing where it needs to adjust and how to, how, to, how to adjust it. Right. Being able to look at a financial report and make sure that it is a full representation of your business, which means you have line items on there that make sense. Mm -hmm. I've seen financial reports where I've seen supplies categorized like five different ways. So you have supplies, office supplies, jobs and material supplies, other supplies and then miscellaneous supplies. I'm like, what's the difference and how do we know if we're spending enough on supplies or not? Right, right. <laughs> what's going on? And they go, oh, well, we've had a couple different bookkeepers and they will all change the category. Well, again, as the, the CEO of this organization, this house, this was your ship. You were supposed to be the one who was looking out for this and making sure that the reports were being generated and that they made sense. You might not be a numbers person, and I hear this all the time, like, I'm not a numbers person. I don't like the numbers. Oh, my goodness, please don't talk to me about numbers. But we all know how to, we all keep some kind of running tally in our head about what's going on. Mm -hmm. And when you look at your financial reports, they're going to tell you, okay, so my gas expense was high, but oh, yeah, I forgot I did a lot of traveling. There were a lot of networking events, and I was going back and forth. So, yeah, that makes sense. Or, you know, the, while the um, supplies did go, get high, well, I forgot we did a couple of, uh, we had it took on a, a new job and we had to, to front load our, our supply costs to cover that job plus that we already had in place so we can get them all done. So when you're looking at it from that, that standpoint, then you can see where things kind of go off track or, or how things might have gone off track so you can correct it. Mm -hmm. But if you're not looking at it from a balanced standpoint, you're not reviewing the reports, and how do you know what to change? Mm -hmm. Know where to make your corrections and your adjustments, right? Yeah. If, if you don't know what to change, then you'll just change it all. That's how we get people who go from business to business. Like, weren't you doing this last last year? What happened? Oh, it wasn't making any money. Well, are you sure? Yeah. Are you sure it wasn't making money, any yeah. money? How did you make that, that, that determination, right? Hey, and, um, Monique and Lelena, I wanted to stop for just a second and see if you guys had any questions or comments so far on, on what LaVon has shared. Um, I just like everything you're saying, LaVon. There's, um, I've been taking some notes. I even drew a little stool. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I, 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 I design, so I'm always like, I like oh, visual. Awesome. <laughs> um, but um, just a some random questions is kind of getting my idea. You're a CPA or you are an accountant? What, what, are you a bookkeeper or? Um, I'm an accountant. I'm not a CPA, but I am, I am an accountant. I'm a registered tax preparer with the state of California. So I do do tax preparation as well. 
Okay. Now, would it be fair to say a bookkeeper just punches in the numbers into your um, financials, but if you had a CFO, they would be able to analyze it and tell you, okay, this isn't the right spending here, like what you were talking about. Would that be fair to say, like analyzing? Because, yeah. It's like, very interesting because over the last 20 years or so, technology has made bookkeeping a new type of service. Before it was someone who their job was, you're right, to do the data entry, to take the check, to take the deposit, to take all that stuff and manually put them into a system. Well, technology has it to where you can download that stuff directly from the bank. Your accounting systems learn your habits. So when it sees staples in the, the description, it knows to make staples the vendor and office supplies the expense. So the data entry aspect of bookkeeping is in a transition. I, I've actually kind of become someone who looks at the term bookkeeping and I don't really like it. Oh that term anymore uh, and only because it's be, people assume that it's just it, it as long as I, I just need to do the data entry and that's when where my, my side of understanding the analysis came into play i was doing so much more than just data entry right line items and going to my clients and going seriously this is what you decided to spend your money on because <laughs> <laughs> right See? You pulled out so, cash and we have payroll this week. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. And I and I I'm in a in a in a certain situation where I have a bookkeeper that that I just give them all my receipts, give them all the sales. Mm -hmm. They put it on the on, in financials, but I don't have a financial person that I can tells me hard like Monique, don't do this. This is good, this isn't working. And I am at the same time. I'm scared to get a new person because it's because I'm a small business. Mm -hmm. It's like giving away like my children because it's money and it's bank. It's just access to, you know, yeah. uh, serious stuff. It's not like doing my social media. I mean, that's also kind of tricky too, but what do you recommend? Like, how do you choose a new person? Um, because I, I actually need somebody that is, like the, the, the financial person that, that I can, that will tell me straight up, like, this is not working. That is <laughs> a great question. I love that. Okay. Because <laughs> um, here, here's the cool part about the accounting industry is there's been a, a shift to advisory type services. What we're, what we're realizing is talking to our clients once a year for tax prep isn't working. Mm -hmm. Because like I said, we, we operate off a of habit. So if I see you in March and you tell me don't do this, well, I'm already in March, so I've been doing it already this year on top of I did it last year. So all, we're gonna, all I know for sure is we're going to have this same conversation next year in, in March because you, we're, you're, you're not supporting me. And on top of that, CPAs and, and high-level accountants were still using the kind of the attorney type model where they were charging you you know, $400 up to $400 an hour, and they were doing it in 15 minute increments. Well, if I know I'm going to get charged that amount, I'm not making that phone call. Right. I'm sending that email. I'm just going to store everything together and try to throw it up on them during that, that one annual meeting or right. would be the quarterly meetings. Mm -hmm. Part of that, part of your question would be it's, um, it's talking to your current bookkeeper to figure out what their level of knowledge is. The data entry part, like I said, is very simple. The, the, the technology has made that easy, so it's no longer the big heavy weight, heavy lifting part of doing accounting because it's very easy to get it in depending on, on the, their level of skill set if they know the different ways of using the software that allow you to import from an Excel spreadsheet as well as do downloads from the bank. Again, we're back at real simple getting the numbers in. It's do they know how to read the financial report and connect it to how your business operates. Mm -hmm. I had a client, um, she was a sales coach and I'm looking at a transaction on her bank statement and I had no idea what this thing was. I mean, the good part about it is I know she was, she's, she's usually someone that stays right in her lane. She does everything quite right, but there was one transaction, a dollar amount and I, the description didn't tell me anything on the bank statement. So me, I Googled the heck out of that description. I found in any possible way I can, I can uh, any possible information I can pull from it so I can get to a website. 
So when I got to the website, I looked at it and I saw that it was basically like gifts. So I immediately assumed it was one of her um, speaker's gifts because she was also a speaker. She, she was a sales coach, but she got her business by going out and doing speaking arrange, uh, engagements. So when I met with her, I said, okay, so here's a, 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 a transaction I wasn't quite sure of, but based off of what you do and looking at your schedule, I'm assuming it was a speaker gift that you bought. And she looked and she goes, that's exactly what it was. And you have no receipt, no nothing. But I know your business. I know what you do. I know what makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really going to be a matter of, of kind of talking to, to your bookkeeper and figuring out what, what their level of knowledge is about your business. Because then they'll be able to look at, your, at the financial reports once they've done the data entry and the bank reconciliations to be able to say, hey, so you started doing a lot of eating out and the business you know what's all what's up with that you know what's what's going on you know you don't get to write that off at 100 percent. it's just not not a highest and best use of your of a tax strategy for you you might want to reevaluate that and see what else we can do with it or they might ask the question hey did you join a networking group that where you guys meet weekly for your meetings and you're probably meeting like an ihop or something like oh yeah well so what i decided to do is instead of putting under meals i'm going to add it as a part of your marketing expenses um, cause you don't eat all the time, right? It's a part you just, you have to pay there to go. They're like, Oh yeah, that, that's right. So it's a matter of figuring out what their knowledge of your business is. And then that way you can, you can communicate with them about what's going on with your business. And then they can support you by helping you say, Hey, okay, well, I'm going to need these receipts or did you make this adjustment? And this is what, I, how I assumed it, but you, you're, you're kind of guiding each other in that process. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, the, the examples you give, are already happening um, she is very much like okay awesome. you know but um, I don't for instance the marketing I have limited capital so deciding where to do the marketing is always like it's just like plain hot potato it's it's <laughs> you know like I, I wish I you know I had spent a large amount of money on these hotel uh, brochures looking back I wish I hadn't done it Mm -hmm. Um, there's all, but then there's things that you don't, because it's it, my business is I'm in fashion design. Um, and it's, you don't know, and there's no one that I can talk to that is in my business, but farther along than I am. Mm -hmm. So it's making those smart business decisions in marketing, but with the knowledge, okay, like this is good, this isn't good. But again, I, I just, it's really difficult for me to find somebody that. And it, it, it does, it takes some, cause it is, you're right. It's like building a relationship with, with my yeah. clients when, when they come and I even change my business model to where instead of it being, hey, I meet you and we just start working together off the bat and working through it. I actually have a kind of a 90 day dating period. Oh. <laughs> I'm learning, I'm learning the business and figuring out the communication style of the business owner teaching them my communication style, identifying what I describe would be good systems for them based off of what I'm seeing in their business and the, the questions, the problems, the concerns that they came to me with. And then for 90 days, we test it out. We determine, does this work or does this not? And in that 90 days, there's a lot of communication. Uh, and during that 90 days, if, if it is a good fit, I do get asked those questions like, okay, so this is what I'm doing with my business and this is what, what do you think about it? And then I am far enough removed of it to say, okay, well, you're gonna, it's going to cost you this to do it. Is this cash or the, the charge on your credit card, is that really the highest and best use of this resource? Considering, because I see the numbers, I can go considering you've got payroll next week. Huh, do we want to risk the cash for payroll? Or I know you got this, you know, this industry uh, event that you go to every year, this conference that you enjoy going to, you get a lot of knowledge out of that. You know, you might be putting that sacrifice in that particular trip or that particular training if we do this right now. Mm -hmm. so it comes a question of transitioning from a one-off, you send the information to your, your bookkeeper to a, I send it, but then we have a conversation about it on a regular basis where I'm not only talking about what I did, but I'm talking about what it is I want to do and we're determining what's the best route for it. So it's more so, of a partnership. Yes. Yeah. Do you, have you in your in your years of doing what you d have done? Um, have you created a model of how, or a kind of an outline of how to find and um, a CFO for people like like a, a a format of what 
what questions to ask or what to find the best fit for a CFO, for a company? It hasn't been so much of a format in that way. That's where the NLP came in, comes into play. Okay. But learning how people communicate. So when I see the way they communicate, then I know how I can adjust to that one. So if anybody's ever done DISC training or anything like that, it's, it's, it's DISC was a, a piece that got broken off of NLP. Mm -hmm. Look at someone and say, okay, so they're, they're a happy person. They enjoy kind of having fun. So it means I know when I communicate about the accounting, I have to either have a lot of fun and then drop that in there and then have a lot of fun afterwards <laughs> so that they kind of grasp it. So it's really not so much of a, of a checklist because you want to make sure it fits into how you operate. So if your style is, you know, um, you're, you're, you're artistic and you're creative. So that's a different style than what kind of traditional accounting type of work is. And um, I don't consider myself a traditional accountant in any way, shape or form. I mean, my male clients, I, I basically like threaten them constantly with you know, <laughs> my female I, clients seem to get it <laughs> i love it i love it i i actually threaten people all the time yeah. my male clients i have to look at them and go okay if you keep doing this i'm gonna punch you in the stomach i'm literally gonna come down there and i'm going to punch you in the stomach <laughs> right so with my with certain male clients they get that um so it's just a matter of of, of knowing what their style is and figuring out how you fit because if they're doing the workload very well then, you know, you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. You want to adjust the communication stuff. Right, right. I know for me, when I talk to my clients, one of the first thing I ask them is, hey, are you familiar or do you utilize any cloud drives? Do you like Google Drive, Dropbox, OneDrive? What do you like to do? Because I like to create paperless systems, especially since I work a lot with my clients virtually. So if you have it, I have it. If I have it, you have it. That's, that's the benefit of using a cloud drive. So I ask them, what, what system do you use? I can use all of them and I can get them all to merge down into how I operate. It's just a matter of how do I create a system that works naturally for what they're doing as opposed to going at them and say, okay, you got to do this, 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 and this. Well, we're already talking about something they don't like, which is the accounting, right? Mm -hmm. it's already outside of their, their, their usual day-to-day -day activities, because if it wasn't, then I wouldn't be, be there, right? So if I'm trying to force something on them, that's going to create a clash. It's going to create <coughs> fighting. So if I can know exactly what it is that they're looking for, if I know exactly how they function and operate, then I just kind of go into how they function and slowly make adjustments to their habits based off of what I'm looking for. So when I say, hey, I don't have receipts for this, so I don't know what this is, and eventually it turns into like, oh, I took a picture of the receipt and I uploaded it to the cloud drive. Thank you. Very yeah. cool. Now I got what I need and I don't have to bug you. I think that, you know, the communication piece that you're talking about is so important because in the past, um, you know, we, we recently relocated, you know, so we had to get a new accountant and a new this and a new that and, you know, all the things that you do when you, when you move. And um, I don't understand our accountant and our accountant makes it pretty clear that she doesn't understand my business. <laughs> and, and she talks up here somewhere, you know, and I mean, she's brilliant. I, she's smart. I have no doubt about that, but she talks up here somewhere and she uses terms that I don't understand. And she will say, well, you can't do this because of blah, 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 which that's <laughs> what it sounds like to me is blah, blah, blah. I don't know what you're saying, you know, and, and I could wazzle dazzle her with technical jargon from my business too, but mm -hmm. it, you know, come on, say it in a way that means something to me, you know? So like last year I said, I, I want to get a new accountant because she makes me feel stupid and I know I'm not stupid, you know? Mm -hmm. And then of course you go through the whole year and then you're like, oh shit, it's tax time now. I guess we'll stick with the same person who I haven't yeah, talked to in a year, you know? So the, the communication piece is so important. What you're saying is so absolutely right on. And you're right that when I was getting my degree in accounting, I was already working with a husband and wife team. The wife did the taxes and the husband did the accounting. Mm -hmm. And I'm in class and I'm going, that, but that's not how business owners present the information. You're telling it to us as though everything is verified and is 100% accurate. These are people we're talking about. They don't know that that should be categorized that way. That's just how they're giving it to you. Right. And it was, that, that's when I realized a big part about it is the communication. The systems is a part of the communication. All of that is, is about figuring out how do you get from, I'm here as far as knowledge of accounting and the business owner is here as far as knowledge of accounting and get to a point where we're speaking the same language. That's really the ultimate plan. 
It's, mm -hmm. I see your business is doing this and it's amazing. Here's some pitfalls that we might want to take in consideration. You know, if you move, move your business in this standpoint, it might cause this level of change in your tax bracket. Or, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm researching these particular tax strategies and I think this is what's going to benefit your business, but it requires us to operate into these formats in order to do this. How, you know, let's, work, let's work together to make that happen. But because of the, the old school style of accounting of the $400 an hour charging you at 15 minute increments, the communication got blocked because there was a, a literal dollar value on the, on the actual communication. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the advisory service that has been, the transition to advisory service that has taken place has been designed to where the business owner feels like their accountant or their bookkeeper, whoever's a part of their accounting team is a trusted advisor. I, I have clients, I'll get text messages. Hey, we're in T-Mobile and we want to upgrade our phones. Like, is it a good thing? Can we do this here? I was like, well, looking at that percentage of, of, of the bill, yeah, go ahead and get the phone. And yeah, your husband, he can get his phone on the bill on, on there too. It's a small enough expense. I'm not worrying about it. Mm -hmm. But you dare, you better do that in two separate transactions. <laughs> but they feel close enough to be able to call me and ask me. I've had meetings via text because they're like, okay, what's going on? Is, is this possible? Yes, you're fine. You can do that. It's okay. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. So the communication, you're right, is crucial. It's, it's, it's having the business owner feel confident enough that they can call and will be guided and informed and then having the professional know that oh so my knowledge is appreciated mm -hmm. you appreciate what i know from this angle of business and how i can best support you right. but it's going to be a win-win on both sides it can't be just well you're my client and you're paying me and well you're you're doing my taxes for me so i don't have to do them myself so mm -hmm. that, that's not the win win <laughs> that's right, that's right. not right. the win win is i get to do this thing that i love to do that i trained i got trained to do and i get to do with people who uh, enjoy and value what it is that i get to do Mm -hmm. that, that's how I look at it and, yeah. and the, 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 the perspective that I put on it. Yeah, that's great. That's brilliant. So if you were not doing this, <laughs> what would you be doing? So um, I thought I was going to be a dancer. <laughs> I actually went what, to What kind school. of dancer, LaVon? <laughs> what kind <laughs> of dancer? <laughs> I probably wouldn't have been none, nothing more than a stripper named Diamond, but above most, <laughs> my goal was to do contemporary <laughs> dance. Monique, I love it. I love it. <laughs> and I went to the school, I went to a school for the arts and sciences here in Southern California. And I, I did, I loved it. It was great. But at the same time, I was also had been interning at my dad's record label. So I was seeing business at like its core. So at the, when I first started at the school, I was interning my, my god sister who was in the marketing department. And our job was to get the, um, the marketing materials for new album releases and things done and laid out, get them approved, get them shot out, find new marketing outlets for us. So while I'm sitting there at the lunch table with kids that are talking about, oh, what are you wearing to the homecoming dance? I'm like, homecoming? I have to get this ad approved. <laughs> <laughs> or the, it's not going out. The album gets released in two weeks. Oh my God, I can't worry about a dress. I can't worry about a party. And then finally it just, um, it, it got transitioned to, okay, I, I love dancing. I do, but I love this business stuff. This, this whole being in, in business, it, it became a, a big thing for me. And then it just made that transition for me. <laughs> wow. That's nice. That's really but in my mind, I'm, I'm a award-winning choreographer. In my <laughs> That's <mind>. awesome. <laughs> You're the dancing accountant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's awesome. Lelena, anything from you? You have any questions or comments? No. I'm muting. I'm muting. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I was responding to a ping that I just got. I have several tabs open, um, <laughs> multitasking at the finest right now. <laughs> um, but I, I, I don't know. So you kind of caught me off guard, but I will say that I learned some very valuable tips um, on here and I'm very impressed with the way that you work. And I love NLP being a Kundalini yoga teacher. <laughs> I relate and very, you know, in depth of 
you know, six or seven years of uh, deep Kundalini training, I, I, I see where you're going in the energetic portion of this. Mm -hmm. And it's very refreshing because um, number one, I have never had a good relationship with anyone that's done my taxes or tried to do my books. And I cannot stand QuickBooks because I just don't get it. It's like, I'm on a realm beyond that. And it's mm -hmm. just never been, I hate it. And so I went old school, took all of my finances back into my control, fired everybody and decided to handwrite everything out every single day and do a handwritten profit and loss statement. And that's just where I'm at right now because I needed to get my head wrapped around what's going on and where, what I'm doing on literally on a minute to minute basis, consciously. And I even got rid of the cards and went to strict cash for mm -hmm. the rest of this year, just because it's a lesson that I needed to do with myself. I'm rebranding I'm restructuring. I'm taking an entirely different path with my business and everything. 95% online. I'm going away from in person. I want to talk to you. I've already just kind of sent you a message on LinkedIn. I wasn't oh, sure awesome. if I was going to get a chance to uh, chime in. I, she, this Monique had a lot of, um, very interesting questions that she needed answered. So I was just letting her run with it and listening <laughs> <laughs> more than anything. <laughs> so um, I'm moving forward for 2020. I'm looking for um, exactly what you're doing to um, do my books, look at my, my profit projections and things to that nature, everything that you just talked about. So I'd like to connect further with you on LinkedIn and stay in touch and I will I be at the breakfast on Thursday in Irvine. I don't know where you are. Um, it's on um, my calendar. I gotta, just gotta see if I can get out there in, in, in time to get there. But what I, I love is that, um, you know, you, when you said you, you acknowledged that you had to step out of a software that wasn't benefiting you. And I had actually developed a, an Excel spreadsheet for people that allowed them to take control, but to not be in an overwhelming environment of quick, because it, it is, it's, there's a lot to that. I teach QuickBooks, um, and when I, I started teaching it, I realized, okay, there's a, we have to break this down. So I actually added some additional trainings that encompass it all together. Because it, it goes mm -hmm. to people about the chart of accounts. You know, how do you categorize transactions based on how your business functions? So I, I wanted to work with people to get them to understand, do you grasp how your business runs? That way, when you do finally look at a financial report, it actually makes sense. Yes, I, I went to that many networking events. Yes, I did that much in travel. Oh yeah, I did do that extra order of materials this time or I transitioned to a new software and that was a new expense. So it makes sense when you do it. So then when you're looking at it and looking, making decisions moving forward, you can go, okay, that was an anomaly, a one-time thing. I don't have to worry about that. Or is that something that I want to really commit to as an expense given where my business is and where I want it to go? Mm -hmm. I love that you were able to, 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 to take control of that and be able to into a format for you to be able to, to manage and, and comprehend on your own. I'm just sorry that you haven't had you know, a great relationship with the previous tax preparers. I mean, I, I think I'm a lot of fun. So. <laughs> well, here's the thing is when you operate on an energetic realm, which a lot of the world is starting to fall suit on, it's really hard to do business with people that do not practice those same things. To at some, whatever the modality, there's many, okay? No judgment on which one's your favorite. But um, when I'm sitting in front of somebody that is just completely westernized and they can't step themselves out of the box, I let, it's hard. It's hard. And I see that you're way out of the box and in the energetic, and I love that. And that's what I'm looking for moving forward is to only do business with the energetic connection. And I, what you just said about teaching people how to categorize those expenses, that's one of the things that I did. I literally fired my assistant because she did not get my books done. And I took my books for 2018 and I sat down and I hand wrote everything, went through every single bank statement and I categorized my expenses to where I knew how I spent them and what they were for. I spent it this way, but it was actually an advertising expense. Mm -hmm. And I got double the money back yep. by doing that. And I realized that I was entrusting my finances with people that were not qualified and that were definitely not on the energetic sphere that I was operating on. So 
I really would like to further uh, my relationship with you, get to know you a little bit, hopefully run into you on Thursday. I do have to jam off of here because I have to take my son to the library. Okay. He's been um, sick for the last week. He has to play catch up. Yeah. So no worries. Well, thank you. I, I, I hope we yeah. connect as well. And yeah, definitely go take, take care of your son. You got to do that. So yeah. Levon, yeah. I got light bulbs going off all over here, ladies. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to meet all of you. How do we get in touch with you, Levon? Okay, um, well, you can definitely go to my website and find um, and do a direct con connection with me there as well as schedule an appointment. Um, it's accountingstrong.com. Uh, I figured that that's when, when I realized that's what I wanted people to be was accounting strong. I want their business to have some, some strengths to it on the accounting side. Nice. So get me at accountingstrong.com. You can email me directly at levon at accountingstrong.com. And you can find me on LinkedIn at Levon Shields. And also on Facebook, though, be cautious because on Facebook, I um, I have some posts that are sometimes funny, sometimes inappropriately funny. <laughs> Great, but whatever comes to, comes ahead, it comes to my mind is where I, I post stuff. So, Lavon, are you in San Diego? Also, I'm are you in, in um, Inland Empire, so I'm just Inland. above San Diego. Nice. Um, and just a little side note, Lavon, I'm a retired professional dancer. <laughs> So oh, no, I love you. I love you. I mean, just everything about you. You're you're just creative, professional, passionate, and uh, yeah, you're just you're you're rad. Yeah. I agree awesome. with Monique. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, thank Takes you guys one to know one, here. right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I just want to say um, thank you so much, Levon Shields, for being with us today, and and thanks to all of you who have joined us here live. Uh, it certainly has been a great conversation. Anybody who says talking about money and finances and accounting is dry should really pay attention and join, you know, <laughs> some of our online forums because it's never anything like that. So uh, thank you again so much for joining us. Encourage your friends to, to make the time to join us. This will be uh, posted online on the CWI website uh, as soon as I get done rendering it, and you'll be able to direct folks to that. So thanks awesome. again so much, LaVon. Um, thank, thank you. So much for thank you. Joined us thank live. you. This has been just a great, great time. Thanks so awesome. much. See you all later. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you, Yvonne. Thank you. Have a good one. You too.